Salman Salkan is a geek and an educator. He won the Princess of Asturias Prize 2019 for international cooperation. At the ceremony that included the traditional sound of Asturian bagpipes, his award was presented to him by Leonor, the heir to the Spanish throne. He then sat down to speak to your news. Mr. Khan, why did you create an online non-profit education system? Well, it started a little bit by accident. I was tutoring family members. Word gets around my family that free tutoring is going on, so I start tutoring more family members. My original background was in software, so I started writing uh, practice and software for them. And then a friend suggested I make videos to, to help as well. Uh, and, and when I made those videos, they were public, and then those became very popular. And you fast forward a few years, there was about 100,000 people who were using it. And I had a job on the side, or actually this was my side project. And uh, at some point I said, I want to do this with all of my energy. And I thought maybe it could be a company. I live in Silicon Valley. There's a lot of venture capitalists who are interested in investing. But do you think that in general, education shouldn't be uh, a business or the two things could live, live together, say? Yeah, you know, my old day job, I worked in finance. I was an analyst at a hedge fund. Yeah, that's which the reason is, why I asked you that question. <laughs> which is as for profit as you can yeah, get. Yeah. And, and I saw, you know, I would talk to companies every day, and I would see how much the ownership structure uh, determined how the company will act. And I even talked to some for profit education companies, and I saw that their motivations were sometimes not aligned with the actual needs of the student. That resonated with me when Khan Academy was happening. And so I do think in education and probably healthcare, those are two spaces where the traditional market forces don't lead to the best outcome. We don't want a world where if someone is bleeding, that you have to check their pocketbooks whether you treat them. Same way we don't want a world that if there's a young girl or boy who wants to learn, that you have to check their pocketbooks before they learn. Uh, we don't want a world where um, our children have far more privilege than kids whose parents aren't able to uh, provide for them. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's, that was the main motivation. So you, you imagine a kind of a safe haven, a backup for people who are in need, basically. In, in this case, or in need of a education. Exactly. You know, education is the ultimate lifeline. Once you have your base necessities, you know, if you have your ba some basic food, basic shelter, uh, safety, uh, then education is what allows you to escape from whatever circumstance you might be in. And so I just like to think, you know, you and I were lucky where we were born and how we were born, uh, but, uh, you know, if you were born anywhere else, what can we do for those people so that they have the maximum chance, at least opportunity? You know, you can't determine where people end up, but at least give everyone the equal access of opportunity to get uh, to reach their potential. Silicon Valley is an example where there's a lot of wealth creation. And so I'm always telling my friends there, I was like, where is the culture? We have a responsibility with this wealth to help create not just technology, not just things that you know people become addicted to on their phones, but things that actually enrich our, our condition. As far as I can see, the Khan Academy is mostly focusing on science, technology, uh, mathematics, of course. Uh, and the only concession you make at humanistic studies is history. Why is that? Yeah, the, we started in math. Uh, that's where my cousins were having trouble, and that's actually yeah. where a lot, my, a lot of my strengths were. And that's also where there was a lot of need. There's a lot of students around the world who are struggling in math especially, and it's holding them back. So that's where we started. Then we went into science. And you're right, we went into history. And I think in, you know, it, things like, we want to do things like writing and literature and uh, many, many other subjects. But online, there's certain things we can do well and certain things we can't do as well. And so our vision has always been, we can, we'll try to do as much as we can on our platform, and then hopefully when students go into a physical environment, into a traditional school, that will free up time so that they can do other things. Uh, so I hope over time we can figure out ways to do most subjects uh, and it can complement traditional schools. There is a kind of widespread fear uh, about uh, artificial intelligence, about robots. And uh, don't you think that maybe increasing the humanistic studies, such as literature, philosophy, would be good also to give people confidence and think, anyway, the human being is still important. We can rule over the robots one day, even if, if they will be perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm a big believer that, you know, as we go forward, the, the reason why we learn isn't just to get a job. It's not, 
our society is changing dramatically because of artificial intelligence, because of you know, biotechnology. Now with things like CRISPR, people can change our uh, humanity's genetic code. So these are big issues that aren't just technology. These are philosophical issues. And in order for us to participate in society and help our leaders make the correct decisions, everyone has to be informed. So to understand what's the proper philosophy, the proper ethics of editing the genome or using artificial intelligence, yes, you need to understand a little bit of computing, and yes, you should understand some genetics, but you also need to understand what, what the great philosophers have thought about. What does it mean to be human? When is it okay uh, to change what it means to be human? And all of these really complex questions, I completely agree. Is there room for religion uh, in uh, this kind of uh, educative structure that you are talking about? Religions can get misinterpreted and get and become That's deviations why, yeah. from the mainstream. We we say this is what uh, Christians believe, but the, and this is what the history is telling us. This is what Muslims believe. This is what uh, and then this is what history tells us. This is what Hindus believe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I can't tell you how many people emailed and they said, "I didn't even know that about my own religion. That didn't even get covered." You know, I grew up in a, a Muslim family, and when I did my research, I tell some of my Muslim families, "Do you know who is the most mentioned person in the Quran?" by a factor of four. And they say, who, Muhammad, Moses? I say, no, Jesus Christ. And they say, wow, I, I didn't know that. When you go to the mosque, they don't talk about Jesus as much. Uh, and so learning even about your own religion from an academic point of view and also a philosophical point of view, I think can actually bring people together. Do you think that this uh, Khan Academy could reach also the most remote areas of the world, such as, for instance, the mountains of Afghanistan or other parts of the world that where education is badly needed? My hope is yes, and it already is. How? Well, you know, so, you know, my family is originally from Indian subcontinent, and the Indian subcontinent, many poor kids there, they don't have access to school or their schools aren't very good, but now uh, cell phone broadband has gone down to two or three dollars or euros a month. And so now if you go to even a remote village in India, Uh, they might not have electricity, they might not even have uh, running water, but they now have internet access. And so that's exciting for us, because then we can start to reach those students. I think the only reason why we won't be able to reach certain areas is if the governments don't allow access. And so that might be a tricky in parts of Afghanistan, parts of North Korea, yeah. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Dictatorships but, in general. Dictate, if, but if that doesn't happen, I think it's an exciting world. We can, we can finally reach these students. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan. Thank you.